this is Father's Day. And, uh, you know, there's something about this, and we celebrate that, kind of like we, we celebrate Mother's Day, right? Uh, not quite with the same umph. <laughs> but kind of, you, know, I, I, you know. I don't know how, why that is. It's just the reality of it. And, you know, of course, all of this was invented by people who want to sell stuff, right? Flowers, chocolate, and tools, right? Uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, but why don't we turn that from just being, uh, and it makes a lot of sense here, right, from, from just being a day of celebration to becoming a day of commitment. You know, that we want to become the best example. The world, more than anything, your neighbors, friends, down your streets, in your workplaces, everywhere you go, need grand examples of godly fathers who can put life together in a strong, strong way. And so I want to talk to us this morning uh, on, on the theme. We're in this series that we, where we highlight the word necessary, right? And there's a lot of things that are good, a lot of things that are useful, but certain things are, are not just that. They are necessary, right? And growth is one of those, spiritual growth. So we're going to talk today about the next session, section here, uh, beginning in chapter 2 in the letter to the Colossians under that theme, necessary growth. And I think we, when we do that, we, we begin to see also those of you who are fathers, father figures, wannabe fathers, uh, or those of you who are missing a father, if you think in terms of, of this kind of necessary growth and how that relates, you will hear this in a, in a special kind of uh, way here, right? So it's Paul's deep desire, right? The church was started by one of his co-workers called Epaphras, and, and Paul is there recognizing, he's not there, but he's writing to them, recognizing he's writing to a key church in a key city that had a significant influence on many places, and he wants to encourage them to get into contact with the living God. You know, he could as well have written to First Baptist Allen, and for, for that matter, when it comes to, to kind of the significance of the location and the opportunities for ministry uh, that were given right there. So he is keenly aware that he needs to kind of encourage them to get in contact with the living God. He desired to see people have their lives actually changed, not just talk the language but live the life. He liked to see people turn into living human beings who, who not only could speak spiritual speech, but who could live lives that other people said, how on God's green earth can they have a family like this? Can they experience these kind of powerful connections like this to have the kind of peace and grace that they have, to be filled with the kind of love that they're filled with? That's what he's about here. Paul had one goal, one purpose when he wrote this letter to the Colossian church, and that was to encourage people to seek God's will, to find his way, and to walk it. And so listen to this as we get to chapter 2 of that letter that he wrote to the Colossian church. I want you to know how greatly I'm struggling for you, for those in Laodicea, and for all those who have not seen me in person. I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm saying this, so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sounds reasonable. For I may, I may be absent in body, but I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see how well ordered you are and the strength of your faith in Christ. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, being rooted and build up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit 
through, um, based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than of Christ. Paul's desire was to see people be changed. This is where we are with this. What does it mean to actually be a growing Christian? We have gotten to some kind of notion that, that the grace of God, you know, just covers all things, and in the end, it really doesn't matter. Never once in Scripture, never once in Scripture is that the case. The call is always to get to know God's will, to walk his way, and to live out his presence. Now, let me, let me give you an illustration to kind of set this off, uh, to just to kind of show how growth matters. It is necessary, not just good, not just helpful, but necessary. So here's Jill. I'm going to call her Jill. Not that you would ever know who she was anyway. But I'm going to call her Jill. That was not her real name. She was uh, an assistant uh, in, in the church that I used to pastor years back. She lost her husband when she was just 48 years old. They had one of these wonderful, perfect kind of marriages, if such a thing exists. Strong family. Loved the Lord. Together. Loved each other. Things were just well. It was clearly a family where Christ kind of radiated his presence in what they, they did. Everything anyone knew was just that great. And then suddenly, Joe, and I'm going to call him Joe, Joe just died. Had a heart attack on the spot from one day to the healthy, strong, 48, running fast, and then fell over dead. Obviously, Jill was devastated. How in the world could this happen to her, to her husband, to their family? And all of us as a church, we love that family. There was a central family in the church. How in the world is God doing such a thing? Crushed with pain. And then shortly after, four, five, six weeks, I remember right. Suddenly, Jill was back. And she was her usual kind of loving, smiling, encouraging self, joy spreading everywhere she go. That was just who she was. And people began to wonder, oh, that can't be. She's probably just putting it on, just showing off some kind of fake Reality. It can't be that she got over it. They saw how crushed she was. And so I sat down to talk to her. And here's what she said. And let me just introduce this by saying that I was just a young kiddo. Oh, well, a little bit more than that, but not a whole lot more. And it just truly suddenly made me realize how much strength and power that comes from someone who has truly grown mature in Christ. You know, maturity is something very important, right? And so what is maturity? You know, for children and immature people, any kind of a reaction to opposition, to difficulty, and to pain is just to throw a fit, get upset, and, you know, just be messed up. Mature people are characterized by the fact that they know how to process that, how to react to opposition, to difficulty, to pain in a way where they draw on resources. And here's what happened to Jill. Jill said, Previn, when Joe died, I thought my world would collapse. Why could God do such a thing? There's nothing like that that, that made any sense to me. I was on my knees hours on hours every day just seeking to figure out what was going on. I read Scripture up and down, page by page, 
until suddenly I got to Acts 16. And I read about Paul and Silas in prison. Beaten, distraught, thrown into the worst hole that they had to throw them into. And what did they do? They praised God. They sang praise choruses. Why? How? Well, it was their certainty. This is her speaking still, right? This is, was their certainty that God was still in control of their lives even when it was the most painful and difficult situation. And because of that, praise flowed from their lips. And as they sang, chains fell off their arms, off their legs. The gates of the prison opened up, and they could walk out. And she said, I read this, and it became like a revelation to me. God had not left me. He was not punishing me. It was simply he was still in control even in the most difficult of situations. He would remove the pain from my inner being. I had one task, and that was to trust him and to praise him. And she said, Prabhupada, that was hard. It's one thing to say it. It's one th another thing quite to get there. But you know what she said? As I began to do this, I found that the heavy chains were falling off my arms, the shackles opened up around my legs, and the gates of prison, my heart and my life's prison kind of opened up. I'm here to trust God in difficult situations. I looked aghast. I was just a young, a young preacher, and, and I looked aghast at her and wondered, where does one find that kind of strength? And I had to conclude this was the place where she had given herself to grow in Christ. That's the kind of effect that, that Paul desires to see among the Christians in, in Colossae. He, he talks to them here in, in chapter 2, and he says, if you follow in the text, I want your heart to be encouraged. I want you to have all the riches of complete understanding. His desire was for them to realize what does it mean to see grows as a necessary reality that we grow deeper in Christ in our understanding. Therefore, we handle the things of life in a different way. You know, it's, it's interesting to see how he prays. Look at verse 1 here, right? I want you to know how greatly I'm struggling for you. Now, he had never been there. He's praying for them. And you, I'm, you know, you read that and you're thinking, what's with that? What's with that? I, you know, it's praying not just that I sit down, I fold my hands, I close my eyes, and I utter some things to God, some desires that I have, or ask him about some things or whatever. Isn't that it? That can't be that hard. How does that align with struggling? The Greek word here is agona, which is the word from which we get the word agonize. Paul was agonizing for this church. Well, the kind of prayer that he was praying, of course, was not just that, right? The kind of prayer he was praying was not just uttering to God that he would like for God to understand what his desires were so that God would agree with him on his desires. Prayer is never just to try to make God's will fit your will or, or, or to bring a list of things to God that you wish that he would fulfill so you could feel good. That was never the point of prayer. In contrast, genuine prayer is a prayer that is life-changing and life-giving. Genuine prayer is for you to seek God's will and to understand God's will and to get to the point well, you can say yes to God's will, even when God's will is kind of 
doing things to you, that he has some things he want to change with you, some attitudes that he want to work on with you, some things that has to do with the way you act and react and, and do things, he wants you to kind of grow in your understanding and to do that, suddenly realize, I've been living this out. I kind of want to be like this. this is what, and then God says, but my will is this. Then you struggle to get to the point where you say, I agree. It can be agonizing to see, I need to change these things in my life. But that is how it kind of works with growth. You see, growth in, in our understanding of who God is, in our walk with God, is not just good, it's not just helpful, it's not just kind of useful at times. It is necessary because life hits us with so many things. And that is why, that is why also it is important to pray in the Holy Spirit as the scripture says. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, we're told. And when we don't know how to pray, it will intercede on our behalf. And, and you know, we like to say that and understand that as a, as a kind of theological truism, as something that is right and true, but it's still somewhat theoretical. Well, for Paul, this is not abstract. This is very real. Pray in the Spirit. Only the Spirit can reveal God's will for us. Imagine this. I sometimes think about this. Imagine this. What if we, instead of running over to listen to what everybody else is saying, to listen to gossips here and there, to listen to the places where we know this life of the Spirit is not at work, and we instead went to seek and to listen to what does God say through his spirit. Imagine that. If we, instead of going, what do you think about this, go to God and say, how? How do I understand your will better? How do I live it out? How do I get to a point where I can actually grow, understand my walk with you in a better and stronger way? So look here, when you look here at the text. The Spirit of God will reveal God's will to us. Help us to walk through, empower us to walk through the struggles that they cause as we are changing our ways and thinking in new directions because we want to be someone who portrays, radiates the presence of God. I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you in my prayers, Paul says, that you will be fully mature. It's another way of phrasing this. Vital, growing faith. This is burned into the consciousness of Paul in such a strong way that, that although he is not, I want you to see this, he is not present in, present in Colossae. He's not there. But he feels so engaged in his prayer that he is able to say to them that I rejoice or delight in the order I see among you. Not that I sense, not that I hear about, not that someone told me about you, but that I see among you. I may be absent in body, but I am there in spirit. So real was his engagement in prayer that he literally felt like he was there. That's engaged prayer, friends. Not easy, but that's what you can learn in the school of prayer. Fully engaged. And then if we take another step into the text, you will see here, I delight in that order, and, and that word, right, in the order I see among you, we like to think of that as just sequence. You know, after all, we got to have order. We can't just have everybody do anything. You know, we got to have order. But the word here is actually a military word, and I want you to see this. 
So what Paul is referring to here, there's a battle, and it's not a for fun battle, it's a real battle. So when soldiers line up for battle, everybody needs to be in their position in order to make this battle winnable. It can't be with soldiers before a battle. They say, well, you know, I'll show up. I just got a few things I need to do, and then I'll be there. You hear me? That doesn't work, friends, right? And so for Paul, when, when, when he's applying this term, the battle is real. It is very real. He warns in the strongest way possible not to give in to this captivating and seductive kind of speech that some who come in are speaking. Look around, and we'll get to that later on. Not here, but just around in the world, right, right outside these doors. Paul saw that as a real battle. The devil is trying his best to lead us off track. But to win the battle... To have this order, I rejoice in the order that I see among you. Every person need to be in their spot. The intercessors need to be in their spot. The leaders need to be in their spot. The strategists need to be in their spot. The practical co-workers need to be in their spot. Those who care for the nurture of their souls need to be in their spot. Everybody needs to be in their spot. As one Greek scholar was explaining it, he said the only way to truly grasp that word is to understand that without this, the battle cannot be won. That's the meaning of that word, order. Are you hearing this? That means that you are needed. You are needed. Everybody is needed on their spot. That's the point. No one can handle this alone, and we know that from life, friends. Who am I kidding? Life can be and is normally very hard. So many things are going on. So many things we can't control. But the language here shows us that we need to be together. He equips the individual, each of us, with his power as we seek to grow in our understanding of who he is, that we together will be able to win the battle. That's the clear call. Find your spot in the church. You are called upon to participate in the battle as God has prepared that, and all together, that's the point. I rejoice in the order I see among you. It reveals that you have understood the necessity of growth in your faith. And I want you to see how powerful that is because he goes on he just can't stop almost I, I i rejoice to see how well ordered you are and also that firmness or the strength or the steadfastness you have in your faith kind of human to kind of swing back and forth a little bit depending on who we are with depending on on you know wh who is influencing us mostly at the moment that was true also of the early church. That's not a modern phenomenon. We don't have it more difficult than they did. That was always the case, not the least in these primary cities like at Colossae or like in, in Ephesus. Let me read to you what he says to the, to the Ephesians. I want you to no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques. Techniques of deceit. Same kind of thing that is going on. In the book of Hebrews, he says, by the time that it passed until now, you should be teachers, but you're still learning basic principles. Friends, may I encourage you, like Paul is doing, in a time where we maybe more than ever is being bombarded by every kind of philosophy. I mean, you can't open any 
radio, you can't open any TV, you can't open any news magazine, you can't open anything without you seeing people say something to the effect, well, all this Christian stuff is okay as long as you realize that you need to change some things. You know, as long as it goes along with who you are, along with what you want, it's fine. But then when it disagrees with what you think, you just change it. And before you know it, it's something that we don't really see. Paul faced that very, very thing in Colossae. And as the contrast to this is his encouragement, have steadfastness in your faith. That's it. It is about giving yourself to the growth that more and more and better and better learn to know the will of God and to walk it. In his letter to Timothy, he speaks about spiritual and physical discipline. Yes? Physical discipline is good for some things. Spiritual discipline is good for everything. You know, I wonder sometimes. A lot of you have Fitbits, yes? God forbid we ever take a step that is not counted. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like walking. You know, I forgot my phone, you know, where that counts my steps. I might as well go back home. It's worth, worthless to walk now without that. So we get really upset, and we look at the thing, and it says, you know, you're at 8,940 steps, and now you see your friend is at 9,410. I've got to get out and walk tonight. <laughs> Imagine if we had a spiritual Fitbit that encouraged us to just do another, to really lean into God's grace. Because physical exercise is good for some things. Spiritual exercise is good for everything. And that's where we, we see the power here. Here's the power, the incredible things about Christ. You cannot exhaust his riches. You're thinking, I'll walk with him for a long time. I've grown a lot. If you knew how I was and who I am now, Christ has done a miraculous work. I understand. He's done that in my life as well. But we cannot exhaust his riches. No matter how long we have known him, how far we have come, there's still new depths to learn. There's still new steps to take. You know, in, in, in the emotional area, we can still continue to strengthen our, our, our ability to receive and to give love and grace. At, at the will level, we can still strengthen our ability to be fully obedient, our ability to really discover and understand his ways and walk them. At the level of health, for that matter, there's always room there to understand better and to experience the healing power that his word will have in our inner being. And the ongoing, the ongoing healing of our wounds, of the heart and soul. Necessary growth, growth is characterized by people who are eager to learn more for spiritual exercises, if you will. May I end this by just encouraging you to look at the imagery that he is that he's using in verse 7. Well, he kind of explains that. Just look at that. In verse 7, right here, right, where, where he says that you need to be rooted. That leads the thoughts to a tree planted with deep roots that it'll hold up against whatever wind comes their way, right? And your, your thoughts may be going straight to Psalm 1, right? Blessed is he who will not following the counsel of the wicked, but who's, he's like a tree planted by the water. And then his next word here is that the build up and establish, that, that leads your mind to a building, a strong building that can stand in, in, in hard weather and, and other things, and, and it reminds you of having the importance of having 
a strong foundation and maybe given that to your children and your children's children and, and to those in your, in your uh, influence, areas of influence. And then it goes on. And it leads your thought to a school situation just as you were taught. You know, when you learn things that you need to know to do things in the right way and to answer the right questions in the right way. And, and then it goes to the word overflowing, leading your thoughts to a dry desert that will be nothing but deadness until these life-giving waters are overflowing and life suddenly becomes possible. This is a rich text, friends. Even on a Father's Day, or maybe especially on a Father's Day, I want to encourage you to not just think of Christian growth as something that, you know, I know a little bit more, but as life-shaping, life-changing, and a life-giving reality. This world needs it. We need it as a church, always. But this world needs a church filled with that. That's my prayer, friends. When people hear about First Allen or hear about individual members from First Allen on the streets where you live, they're thinking, oh, that's that people that takes discipleship, deep growth, in their understanding of God's ways. Serious. God has changed them. I wish he could change me the same way. Can that be our prayer? Let us stand. Father, speak to us. Thank you for the fathers that lived this out, but for all of us, Lord. May that be a deep yearning that as we read this text, Again and again, we see what Paul says when he says, I am agonizing for you that these things will be a reality among you. And not only you, but also those in Laodicea and all those who have not seen me. That includes us, Lord. Speak now. With power and with clarity. By your Spirit each of us, Lord, and to all of us. In your name we pray. Amen.